welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm Nikki Wallman. Born in Cape Town on the 1st of January 1914, Louis Rabinovitz has lived through a century of history that has borne witness to change, development and turmoil. This, however, has never stopped him from passionately travelling around the world in the pursuit of discovery and meeting various Jewish communities along the way. In 2011, he sat down to write his life story. And this guy has certainly been around. Now, I'm, I'm very family conscious, and I was talking to people, you know, over the years, and telling them, you know, where I've been and what I've seen. And they tell me, why, why don't you put it down in writing? Because when you're gone, it's all forgotten. Geography and, and, and these status were my favorite subject. And uh, I used to sit uh, quite often, uh, even after school, sit with an atlas and just see, you know, the names of the countries and, and uh, what climatic conditions and so forth. I was always very interested in geography. And as soon as I was able to, and uh, after, of course, during the war, they were, you couldn't go anywhere. But uh, as soon as the war ended, I started traveling, which I did for the rest, virtually for the rest of my life. Grandpa was always finding things out. He was always researching things before he went overseas. And um, I'm that way as well. You know, when I'm doing anything in business or in pleasure, I also find out exactly everything about the subject. And I'm curious as well. I don't do it just as a, as a chore. I do it because I'm genuinely interested, like, like my grandfather. I wanted to see how the, other, how the other part of the world lived. And the London Jewish Chronicle used to publish uh, the names and addresses of all Jewish communities throughout the world. And uh, Gitlin and the library always had got a copy. So whenever, be, before I, any trip before I went, I used to look up. And they, they gave you the names and addresses and how to, how to get in touch with Jews all over the world. And I made it my business to, you know, to, to try and meet these people. My grandfather always told me about, you know, th experiences he had and people he met in these, in these shuls and how unbelievably um, kind they were and how much he found out about the city from these Yiddish people that he met on Friday nights and Saturdays. And I've only discovered this in the last couple of years. And the experiences I've had, it's been amazing in my 40s to come home and share them with my grandfather. And he had those experiences you know, 50, 60, maybe even 70 years ago. And I get to share them, you know, as soon as I came back from Hong Kong, he wanted to know all about the sailor that I went to, who was there, was it Ashkenazi, did they sing Chad Gadya, what tune was Dayainu, were there matzo balls, you know, and I get to share it with him, so I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged, I'm very lucky. The first sailor I went to overseas together with my wife was in Rome, which is mostly Sephardic, but there's a, there's a small Jewish community of the Orthodox ones, and we went to, we went to a Seder there. Wherever I had the opportunity, I either went to Shul or I attended Seder, uh, Seder Sadorim. old age of 99, Louis Rabinovitz has had only two jobs in his life. He was involved in a family business for 46 years and in a property company for 33 years. Louis still goes into the office every day and perhaps it is this coupled with his love for family that is the secret to his longevity. He doesn't uh... Act 99, he doesn't look 99, he's always busy, he doesn't like to be bored. 
He plays bridge, he goes out with his friends, he goes to visit the elderly in Highlands House. <laughs> <laughs> He's an amazing man, still working at this age and it, it's embarrassing. Clive can't, re can't retire, he'd love to, but I mean, how can he retire when his father's 99 and still working? He has a cell phone and, and he has email. So, you know, a lot of people, they, their grandparents are dragged because they've got to keep going over and pointing out pictures and stuff. I mean, you know, we regularly email my grandfather, I mean, my, my, we file our tax return together and the, and the auditors email him and then he'll print it out and phone me and we'll go through it line by line, which almost keeps him young. And that's been the, the unique thing that's kept us genuinely in touch. To him and to us, the importance of family is absolutely supreme. There's nothing, there is nothing more important. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, how it, that's how it's always been and I guess how it'll always be. I would say to, to live a, a normal, humble life, uh, be charitable, try not to lose your temper. Fortunately, I, uh, I don't bear grudges because that can shorten your life very quickly. And I try and be as uh, calm as possible. You do lose your relax sometimes, obviously. But the main thing is, is don't be any grudges because that will shorten your life very quickly. The Jewish mystics teach that people have a drive towards the good and holy because that is what we are, nothing less than divinity in disguise. In other words, people have a sense that there is goodness in the world and that they are meant to be aligned with it. This means that human possibilities are in principle boundless and our perceived limitations but symptoms of the disguise we are meant to shed. But what is it that makes each one of us uniquely human? Most of us subscribe to the, the notion and the belief that all men are created equal. But a brief look at the world as we know it would suggest otherwise. We're not really equal. In what way then are we all considered to be equal? But if we explore the human experience, we do note that there are certain aspirations that are common and that are in fact uniquely human. The desire to go beyond oneself, the very search for meaning, the sense that there is a wrong and right in life. These attributes of the human being, the Kabbalah understands to be an expression of the soul, the uniquely human soul. And in this way, we human beings are in fact unique to all the creatures of the world, not as some would have us believe that the human being is but a sophisticated animal. The unique soul within us differentiates us and is also what makes us all essentially the same. So what is the nature of that soul? In Jewish philosophy, it talks about two aspects. We talk about a creator, i.e. a reference to God and then creation. But the Kabbalists introduce us to another notion. This is termed in the Kabbalah or Ein Sof, which means the light without end or the infinite light. So we have God and then we have or Ein Sof and then we have creation. What is this or Ein Sof? Or Ein Sof is an emanation of God. Just like light does not exist without the source of light, when the sun sets, the, there's no more light around, so too, this emanation is only available in the presence of God. So it's not God himself, but it's nothing else but God. We can term it godliness. This, the Kabbalists tell us, is the nature of the soul. The soul is really an expression of godliness within us. And it takes on certain characteristics that are reflective of the divine characteristics utilized in creation. This gives us an understanding of the verse at the beginning of Genesis that tells us man is created in the image of God. Surely that's not meant to be understood in the physical sense, 
God has no form, but our spiritual identity, the inner self is reflective of the true divine identity. And it develops certain characteristics, but essentially it is a force that seeks to transcend the limitations of our material and physical world. Practically, it's that part of us that is able to see beyond ourself, to be concerned for the other, to engage in truly altruistic acts. So the body is a casing for this soul. Now this insight really allows us to consider ourselves not so much as physical beings that are capable of having a spiritual experience, but in fact we are spiritual beings somehow enclosed in a, in a physical body. So when we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be human? Who are we really? Well, our inner identity is really a godly emanation. How then do we live true to ourselves? Well, it means living a more godly life, a more generous life, a life where we're concerned and we are capable of stepping beyond our own personal selfish pursuits and finding ways of giving to others and the world around us. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's show. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you'd like to watch any previous shows you might have missed, you can find them on our website at www.spiritsister.co.za. And of course, you know how much we love hearing from you. So find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. As always, from me, Nikki, and the Simcha team, shalom and have a safe and peaceful week.